Whether it's in the air, on land, the sea, or under it, the SimNet is your simulation network. If you've been around flight sims for any period of time, you've probably pulled a few triggers and noticed that they tend to vary in quality and tactile feedback. Over the last two years or so, I've been on a journey to strike a balance and DIY a flight sim trigger that bridges the gap between cost, function, and feedback. I'm also happy to share that these designs are now open source and free to download and modify to your heart's content on my new printables page, linked in the description. As always, my objective with this project was to achieve something as close as possible to the real thing while still making sense for a sim environment. If you don't want to spend upwards of 300 US dollars on a real mil spec trigger, you've come to the right place. Recently, I ran a poll and I noticed that a few of you don't have access to a 3D printer. That's where online services really come in handy. And I am thrilled to share that this channel now has a sponsor, PCB Way. I discovered PCB Way while searching for an online vendor who could help manufacture these super slick five way PCBs designed by iMark Comedies on Reddit. While I was on their site, I discovered that they do even more than just PCBs, including 3D printing services, CNC machining, and assembly as well. So if you don't have access to a 3D printer, PCB Way offers that service. I was a customer before they ever reached out to me, so I'm happy to partner with them for my next few videos. So here's the thing. Joystick triggers vary in a few key areas. Let's talk about trigger stages. At the entry level, most joystick triggers will be single stage, meaning when you pull back, you activate one switch, like pushing a button. As you move up, you start to see dual stage triggers, meaning when you pull back part way, you activate one switch. And as you continue pulling, you activate a second switch. You can find dual stage triggers in most Thrustmaster, Verpal, and VKB sticks, to name a few. This makes sense as many real military grips feature dual stage triggers. For example, the venerable P-51 Mustang featured a first stage that triggered the gun camera and a second stage that actually fired the guns. Another example is the F-5 Tiger, where the first stage opens the gas deflection doors and the second stage fires the guns. In the F-4 Phantom, the first stage also triggers a gun camera and the second stage fires the missiles. You get the idea. If we're going to replicate a real military grip, we want two stages. Next, let's discuss the switches used in the triggers themselves. The most basic trigger simply depresses a tactile switch inside the grip. There's little to no travel, and the tactile feedback and force required to actuate depends entirely on the quality of the tactile switch. The benefits here are likely cost, simplicity, and rapidity, meaning you can pull this trigger likely as fast as you can click a mouse. And if you ever played Sims in the 90s, like Mech Warriors and others, that wasn't a bad thing, and it's likely why these were so popular in grips like the Sidewinder and the Force Feedback 2. As you move up, you start to see triggers that leverage springs and either tacked switches or micro switches. Here we start to get closer to the real thing. The trigger itself usually has some degree of rotation, meaning you actually get travel before actuating the first and second stages. In something like the X56, this is accomplished with two micro switches and a cammed trigger body. In the Thrustmaster and Verpal grips, this is two tacked switches arranged with two springs of various length and thickness. This is good, and you can increase the forces here by using thicker springs, but in terms of clicky actuation force, you're still limited by your tact switch for that feeling. My joystick trigger journey began with a combination of these two methods, a micro switch for the first stage, followed by a tact switch for the second stage. This helped me with some proof of concept prototypes, but the actuation felt quite light and required barely any force to activate. I then moved to a dual tact switch, dual spring arrangement, whereby the first spring depressed the first switch through tension about halfway through the travel, and the second stage was activated through direct contact with the second switch. This is what I released my B8 grip with, and it's very similar to other flight sim joysticks with dual stages. I very intentionally designed this as a trigger module from the start, 
so that folks could swap these out with other trigger modules with higher or lower spring forces or single or dual stage variants, depending on their specific applications. To make a single stage, simply remove one of the tack switches. Need more force? Add another spring to the second stage or insert a thicker spring entirely. There is an upper limit with this setup, however, as in order to approach real trigger forces with this setup, a thicker spring seems to reduce the tactile feedback of each of the stages. And that's really the kicker. Real trigger forces far exceed what this module is capable of as is. A few months ago, I got the chance to sit in a real cockpit and pull a few triggers, and I immediately noticed something. It felt nothing like any joystick trigger I had ever pulled. The first and second stages required significantly more force than I expected, on the order of several pounds of force, and the action itself felt more like a high buckling or break action in both stages. I also noticed that there was still travel with high return force even after breaking through the second stage. Doing some digging on the real mil-spec triggers, I learned that they have actuating forces of between 5 and 7 pounds per stage. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out to the National Air Force Museum of Canada and the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum for having open cockpits that the public can access. If you get the chance, be sure to check them out. I've left links to their websites below. This video is not sponsored by them, I'm just a fan. I'd also like to give a shout out to Biker Sid and Right Rider Left Stick for their help in the HOTAS DIY Discord. I've linked the Discord below as well. The HOTAS DIY community has always been very inviting and collaborative, even for a beginner like me. When I posed the question, why do military triggers feel so different than SIM triggers, they were able to set me on the right track for my next version. It turns out, Real triggers use mil-spec microswitches with very high actuating forces. Like the mil-spec triggers themselves, these microswitches are available for sale. However, their cost reflects their function. They are hermetically sealed, can operate in extreme temperatures, and operate perfectly under the high G-loads a fighter jet would experience. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty sure I've only experienced one G in my simpit. So those extra features that cost so much are lost on me with this project. Searching for a cheaper alternative, I found these micro switches, and they just so happen to fit perfectly within my existing trigger module body. I was pleasantly surprised as this means I can swap between these versions depending on my use case. I love modularity. Now in testing, the micro switches themselves only required a few newtons to actuate. So at first I thought I would run into the same issue I had with the tact switches until inspiration struck. It occurred to me that if I applied force to the micro switch in a different direction than straight down, I could delay the buckling action until I had the desired braking force. This is similar in concept to delayed blowback operation. And the best part is hallelujah, it worked. I fired up Blender, and by arranging the switches in opposite directions and designing a cammed surface on the bottom of the trigger itself, I could actuate both stages with high buckling force. In fact, by changing the angle of each side independently, I could also vary the force required for each stage. Finally, the fabled 5 to 7 pound brake force of a mil spec trigger without the price tag was within reach. The final hurdle was the return force. I initially used a thick spring, like the second stage of my first trigger module. This felt good, however, the only downside was that there was sometimes what I can only describe as a mushy crinkling sound as the metal interacted with the plastic. After a short experimental period, with some opposing face magnets, inspiration struck again when I picked up my wife's hair clip. There, plain as could be, was the solution I had been searching for a torsion spring. High tension, consistent return force, no mushy feeling or crinkling sound, and best of all, an even more compact package. With this torsion spring in place, I'm happy to report that the trigger module is complete. For now. What remains to be seen is the longevity, as the plastic rubbing on plastic could wear down over time, but 
For now, this is the best feeling sim trigger I've felt compared to the real thing. So I've released the files to my new printables page for free and open source for the community to download, tinker with, and enjoy. Work on this trigger was intimately related to my next grip designs, which we'll be releasing soon, one for free and one for sale. These have been a labor of love and I can't wait to tell you all about it. Stay tuned in the coming weeks as they approach the final stages, no pun intended. If you don't want to miss the video when it drops, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon. And hey, if you like this video, be sure to leave it a like and comment down below as it helps the channel grow and reach more like-minded folks. Thank you for tuning into the SimNet, your one-stop shop for all things simulation, till we meet again.